Okay, you start. He'll pull new features. Who, who uses Postgres? Who doesn't use Postgres? Why are you here? Is you the best speaker? <laughs> okay, you're here because you should be using Postgres. <laughs> and you know. So Postgres has Perl embedded in the server. Uh, this is really rather an awesome feature. And I, s I work at a company now that uses Postgres heavily in, in the server, has a lot of code that runs in the server. And so I took the opportunity to do a bit of work for Postgres 9 to polish up the in internals bit and address some annoyances. So I'm going to be covering some user level stuff, some internal stuff things like D DBA and then MIT prof. It's one of the things, because we've got so much code that runs in the server, we didn't have much visibility of, of how fast it was running or how slow, other than it was not fast enough. So, user stuff. First thing is a bunch of built-ins. There was a lot of Perl code that was doing things that should just really have been built in. Quite a lot of the Perl code that we had was constructing SQL statements that it then ex executes. So we were fiddling around doing quoting and stuff. So now there's a set of built-ins. Quote literal, quote nullable, quote idem. Quote literal and quote nullable do exactly the same thing um, when not given an un undef. They just quote the string ready for putting into a SQL statement. Quote idem quotes a string in a way to use it as an identifier in SQL statements like that. Table if you give them an undef, then quote literal just gives you the undef back, quote null, null will handles the undef sensibly and gives you the string null that you can then embed into a SQL statement. Those, by the way, are all thin wrappers on Postgres in internals. So there's not, there's not Perl code behind those, there's C code, so they do the right thing and they do it fast. Same for these, encode by day and decode. Byte. These use the new, the, the more modern form of the, the byte in, encoding. And again, these are just thin wrappers on the, the Postgres internals. So if you're handling byte data, this is now fast and simple. Something that's not a, a, a Postgres built in, but is a Perl built in, looks like number. Um, there's some strange code in, in our stuff that decides if it's being given a number or not. So I threw, threw this into. Um, uses the same logic that Perl uses to decide if something is a number or not. Slightly more sophisticated, you can now encode arrays as the literal syntax using braces or the array constructor syntax using <coughs> array in the square brackets. Uh, if you're using Postgres, you should be familiar with those. If you're not, then that's just gibberish to you. Okay. Uh, right. Much more interesting. It used to be that inside the Perl code that runs in the server, you couldn't load modules. And you couldn't uh, use modules. You couldn't just import them the way you naturally would. <coughs> so strict was available, but you couldn't say use strict. You had to do this silly thing, which was just a noise. But now you can say use strict. The trick is that the use works for any module that's already loaded. You're not allowed in the trusted Perl environment just to load any random module because that's safe. You don't want random code running inside your uh, Postgres server. But now you can say use script and there's a bunch more modules that are available to use. You can use warnings, use car, use feature, and use UTF-8. They're all available. You can just use them in your intended Perl code. Previously, if a warning was generated from um, from your Perl code, you used to just get the warning printed with no sense of where it came from in, in the control flow within the server. And also, that used to be warning, so it used to be notice rather than warning. But now it comes out as warning, and it tells you the PL Perl function that was called, which gives you which is it's very helpful in the sense of working out uh, the control flow. I, I didn't do that, but Alexi did. One of the features of uh, Postgres 9.0 is that you can now run random bits of Perl code without having to write a store procedure. You don't have to sort of create functions through SQL. You just say do and then language PL Perl. And this is a, a great feature, very handy just for running random bits of Perl, Perl code without uh, having to do the overhead of writing it, wrapping it up in, in procedure and then calling the procedure and then throwing the procedure away. <coughs> 
there was a really weird bug in the sort code. So you couldn't sort using A and B in Postgres for obscure reasons to do with the fact that Postgres used to use the safe module to, to make your Perl code, uh, mm -hmm. to secure your Perl code, or se secure the Postgres server from any risky effects of your Perl code. But because it used the safe module, the sorting by A and B didn't work for very obscure reasons. Um, but now it does. And now it does partly because we can give ripped out the safe module. And for reasons that I'll explain shortly. Another thing you couldn't do, for various reasons, partly related to the safe module, you couldn't use eval. You couldn't use exception handling in, in your Perl code, which is like really annoying if you've got a sophisticated chunk, chunk of uh, Perl code running in, in your server. You want to have exception hand handling. And you just couldn't do it. Now you can. Slightly more esoteric M blocks didn't run at all, so you couldn't define an M block. Uh, you probably wouldn't want, want to use that, but I did because I wanted to be able to do profiling within the server. And to do profiling within the server, I wanted to be able to write out the profile at the end of the, the session. So now they can. The compromise is that they, they can't access the database because the shutdown happens at a strange time. That might change in a few, future version. And also, warnings are now warnings. There used to be notices for some strange reason, but they're now warnings in 9.0 and later. OK, any questions about that lot that I buzzed through far too fast? Are any of those things like quite literal implementations available to use in client side file code? Is that in the library or is it embedded? No, it's all in, it's embedded in, in the server. And it's not just embedded in the server, but they're just thin wrappers around server in internals. They're not written in code. No, and it's always struck me as strange that the PQ doesn't offer those kinds of things. They're quite malleable, but much useful. Yeah, but it, it's pretty trivial. You know, it's not complicated code. So, um, and I think the, the Postgres driver offers access to certainly it does quote no, 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 no that's the DBI quote function, and quote identifiers there too. The, the array constructor should probably be exposed, but anyway, I digress. Any other questions about that stuff? No. Okay. Who, who, who here manages a Postgres installation? Who's a DBA in some form or other? A few people don't want to admit it. Postgres is a little more work to, me, to, to DBA than uh, MySQL, but it's worth it. Okay, so the safe modules used, the safe module, it was kind of like a, a can of worms that uh, just kept giving new worms. And so it got to the point where the Postgres developers were thinking of removing the PL Perl language. There's two versions of PL Perl inside the Postgres server. There's a PL Perl language and a PL Perl U. And PL Perl U is called the untrusted language. For historical reasons, it's kind of silly, but the PLPL U is the one that is unrestricted. So you only allow trusted users like DBA to use the PLPL U language because it can do whatever you like, it can completely mess up your server. But the PLPL language by default used the safe module. And so you couldn't damage your server, you couldn't access files, you couldn't do anything remotely risky in theory in the PLPL language. So that was safe to give your untrusted users. And th that implemented the safety using the safe module. Unfortunately, the safe module is not as safe as it pretends to be. Uh, and it turned out that there were all sorts of bugs that kept causing problems. So the Postgres developers were looking at removing the PLP language. So you'd only be able to use the PLP U, and so ordinary users wouldn't be able to use the PLP language because ordinary users wouldn't be trusted. Um, so in the end, I managed to avoid the problem by just completely ripping out the PL Perl, sorry, ripping out the safe module entirely. So I'll talk through the life cycle of the interpreter shortly, but there's now no safe in it. The entire interpreter is locked down. Another internal thing, if you're dealing with encodings, um, whenever you return a value in, that should be encoded, the encoding is, is checked. So the bottom line is if you're using UTF-8 and you screw it up, it'll tell you you screwed up much sooner than you would up, up otherwise. I did some internal code refactoring and cleanup. There's some things that I didn't get around to doing that would improve performance that I might get to, probably not for 9.1, but maybe 9.2. <coughs> uh, it still uses uh, implicit context, so it's very slow in threading. 
If you can build your own Perl to be used with Postgres, you should build it without threads. It'll be much faster. Build it with multiplicity, but without threads. And it'll run much faster. Your Perl code will run faster. OK. DBA stuff. <coughs> The big new feature in PL Perl is that you can now define some Perl code to be run early in the life of the, the Perl process. So you can preload modules, you can pre-configure modules. So there are three of them, on init and then on PL Perl U and on PL Perl. So this one always runs and then either one of these, depending on which language is being used. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to walk you through now the life cycle of an interpreter. The interpreter object is created, and as part of that it will interpret the Perl 5 opt environment variables. It's a very useful trick um, that goes all, all the way back in old versions of Postgres. You can influence the Perl inside your server by setting the Perl 5 opt, so you can force it to preload modules. And I think not many people knew you. I think it came as a surprise to the, the Postgres developers. Then some bootstrapping code is executed just to set up the PL Perl environment, and then this new PL Perl on <coughs> code runs. And that code can do whatever you like. It's kind of similar to the PL Perl 5 opt, but it's embedded into the configuration. Now, the important point is you can, if you use this shared preloaded libraries configuration option, you can get that to happen in the postmaster process, so which is like the parent of your backend processes. So this is a bit like mod Perl preloading your code, so that when a new connection comes in, you don't have to execute this stuff in when the connection starts. All these modules can be loaded into the parent process, so it's already there, and when the parent forks, the Perl is already set up. Postgres developers don't really like the fact you, you can do this because technically you could destabilize the postmaster process, which should be really stable. But if you're in an environment where there's a lot of connections ha happening, for some reason you're not using a, 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 a proxy or connection pooling, then this trick, if you're using a lot of Perl code, you can get the Perl code loaded in, preloaded in the postmaster, so it's just already set up, ready to run. Otherwise, those steps happen when you first connect. <coughs> Sorry, not when you first connect. When you first use the PL Perl language, those things will happen. And then almost immediately, <coughs> these things happen. If you're using the PL Perl language, um, it loads strict warnings features cart, and then it disables a bunch of ops. So you can't use require. Well, actually, it's not strictly true. You can use require. It substitutes that op for a require that will silently return yes if the module's already loaded or die. But things like op opening files, you're not allowed to do. So it disables a bunch of opcodes. It then destroys the dyno loader package so that in theory you shouldn't be able to load any modules properly. Uh, and then it runs the, this code. So this code, the on PL Perl init, can't do unsafe things. So the goal mm -hmm. is that the end, untrusted users can set that via an environment variable, and I'll show you that later. So they, the code there runs restricted. So your DBA can preload whatever modules you want from the on Perl in it on the previous page. And then users can kind of tweak their environment, like for example, setting a debug flag in their environment. Database access is then enabled, so you can't access the database here, um, because then you get into issues about how, how you do transactions and things, and how, how you roll back if something goes wrong. And then the interpreter is made available for use and executes whatever it was that triggered all this stuff. So all this stuff happens on demand. Okay. If you then use the PL Perl U language, a new interpreter is created and goes through those steps. Okay. All the other way around, if you use PL Perl U first, then all that stuff would happen for PL Perl U, and then when you use the PL Perl language, a new interpreter is created and goes through all, all those steps. The reason that's an important point is if back here, you loaded a bunch of modules here, and you did this in order to get them loaded in the, um, in the postmaster process, if the very first use is the PL Perl U language, then all those things have to happen again when the PL Perl 
Peel Pearl is used, if you see what I mean. So you can only preload one interpreter, even though if you may be using two. So if you're in an environment that uses both Peel Pearl procedures and Peel Pearl U, there's an issue of which one gets used first. So that's a bit e e esoteric, so I probably shouldn't bother getting into that too much. Okay, um, also, fairly re recently, I spotted a bug when I was using the, the nine, working on the 9.0 stuff, um, which I didn't fix, I just told the security people and they computed it and they fixed it more recently. Is anyone use security definer functions? Where you can define a function that doesn't execute with the permissions of the caller, but executes with the permission of whoever defined it. No one? Well, great. Don't worry about this. But basically, it was possible to booby trap the Perl interpreter so that when somebody ran a security definer function, uh, you could inject code that would do whatever you wanted. So that was a fairly serious bug. So what happens now is if you use security definer, a new interpreter is created for each effectively for each role, but that's easy to hurt. you don't want to know. Finally, when the session ends, uh, access to the database is disabled and then n blocks run. So you can't access the database in n blocks, but I don't mind. Okay, any questions about all that? Oh, grand. So, how do you use this? Well, you could just put it all in one line, you use whatever library directory and then use a bunch of modules. What I'd recommend to you is require Peel Pearl on init and then you can just edit that Pearl file and stick in whatever initialization you want. But, very important, if you load in a module that gives access to the file system, for example, or you load in a module that has a dependency, that has a dependency that has a dependency that loads in a module that gives access to the, um, the file system, you are screwed security-wise. So you need to be very careful about what you allow, because anything that happens here um, persists. It's inside the Perl interpreter, and it persists even when the interpreter is locked down, trying to make it safe. If you've already loaded something that gives access to the file system, for example, it's not going to be undone. It'll still be available for your users. So you need to be really careful about what you load. Only load stuff that doesn't provide any access to the file system. For example, and that's just one, you know, or crash memory or whatever. So to find out what's really being loaded, this is a great tool to develop a trace summary, and you just set it on the environment, start up your server, run your code, see what's being loaded. There's also a new one, Devil Trace Use, and it will show you in which sequence it was loaded and what depends on what. Okay, it's like book. Trace Use. Mm -hmm. Okay, very useful. Excellent. So find some way of finding out what's really loaded and then look at source code. If, if you care about security, I mean, a lot of environments don't really care that much about security, but um, this, is, this is the price we pay for getting rid of safe. But if you haven't have got rid of safe, then you, you just wouldn't be using PLPL language in Postgres 9 at all. It would have been ripped out. So I think it's a small price to pay. Okay, so you have preloaded a bunch of modules in your configuration. Even though those modules are available and preloaded, you should still explicitly use them in the functions that want to reference them. Because that means if they haven't been loaded, because say you're working on a new configuration of a replica and the DBA hasn't set up the config, it'll tell you immediately that they haven't been loaded. Okay. It's also kind of documentation that this function uses these modules. So and then PLPLU, it'll just actually do the use. It'll be PLPLU is un unrestricted. There's no uh, no security there at all. So it'll actually trigger the use and PLPL and check that the module was loaded. Now PLPL in it, the idea behind that was that ordinary users could set an environment variable like that to, for example, set a debug flag. So then the code would do more tracing or debug whatever you wanted. My goal was to be able to trigger <coughs> the profiling, was to load uh, MIT prof that way. Um, sadly, in the course of the negotiations to get this in, um, there were risks, there were concerns expressed about letting ordinary users do that because they could booby trap things. 
So that's been addressed now, so that restriction may get removed, so ordinary users will be able to do the PG options, but right now you can't. Exactly. Okay. Any questions about all that? Okay. NYT Prof. So, I work at a company that has thousands of lines of pill code that run inside the Postgres server. And it spends way too long inside the Postgres server. So we needed to know how long it takes and how long each bit takes. And I happen to know a tool that does that. <laughs> but getting that to work inside the Postgres server proved to be a bit of a challenge. Um, but it works now. And I've wrapped it all up in this Postgres TLPL MIT module. So you can stick it in the Postgres <coughs> config, but that would be an unusual thing to stick in the Postgres config. You usually just use it occasionally. So I recommend using the pub by opt environment variable and just doing a PG control reset. That's available immediately for all connections. So if you're working on a shared development environment with other people connecting, they're all going to get profiling enabled and you'll get um, you'll get profile files appearing all over the place. So what you'd normally do is you use it on a private development server that just you're connecting to. Or you can say MIT plus start equals no. Start it up, and then it's in the server, but it's not running. And then, if you want to do profiling of your session, you can do a DB enabled profile in the session, and that triggers and turns on MIT prof for just your session. So that's a very handy way of doing it. And that's this is cheap enough that you could just leave it permanently like that in your development server. You know, it's not going to cost you much performance-wise. So you can have an MIT prof just available in the development server to use whenever you want. So what happens at the end of a session where you've turned on M MIT Pop is you'll get an MIT Pop out with a, a PID at the end of it. And that's the process ID of the back end, the Postgres back end that handles your connection. And then you just run MIT Pop to get the output. Do you want to see it? Yeah. So here's one I prepared earlier. Now let's restart the server. And then, this is my demo script of the day. Uh, this isn't terribly sensible code, I just threw it together to demonstrate something. Uh, digest MD6, because most folks don't have MD6. So MD6 I had uh, creates uh, an MD6 digest object if it doesn't have one already, and just adds the arguments to it. Uh, MD6 hex grabs the object and returns the, the hex digest. Uh, select same in there, just adds a series of numbers into the MD6 and then selects the result back out. Trivial stuff. So that'll run that code uh, 100,000 times. And then there's a create a replace function that does the same thing, but does it by an SPI exec call. So you're dynamically creating some SQL and e executing it. Does that all make sense? So, we'll run that. Check, 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 check. Talk amongst yourselves for a while. Okay. So now we have an MIT prof output file in that directory. I know it's the, actually I was, I know it's the only one I was about to say, but I know it isn't actually the only one, because I'll delete that one, or delete them. Run it again, so talk, talk amongst yourselves for a while. <laughs> so it creates one profile per session. So per session, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And then... Right. So that reads it in, generates the reports. And then ching. So here is an MIT prof from your Perl running inside your Postgres server, which is kind of handy. Now, most of this stuff down here is all just uh, set up. It's Postgres stuff, most of the UTF-8 and uh, setting up. What you really care about is this stuff up here. So we'll go and look at that. So this is the source code of the eval 
source code of the eval that PL Perl used to generate your, to wrap up your code. So this is your code that you saw in the SQL, wrapped up with a bit of Perl here and here to embed it into the Postgres server. So you see MD6 add and then double underscore and the object ID of the, the function. You can ignore that and then it returns the reference here. So what you're looking at is this was called 10,000 times by our select statement and then another 10,000 times by, sorry, 100,000 by SPI exec query. And da, 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 you see the use there, you see the begin and the import, and you see one call to MD6 new, and then one second making 200,000 calls to MD6 app. <coughs> There. I could get into explaining some of this. Um, there's, there's a bunch of numbers here that are kind of relevant. There's this 4.8 seconds, and then there's this, that's your 4.8 there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to bother getting into explaining how all those numbers work. Um, any questions? That's the easy way. <coughs> Ten minutes, so I'm going to stare at you for ten minutes and talk something else. <laughs> it usually works. Not scary as you said, though. Sorry? You're not scary as you no, said. No, no one is as scary as you said. <laughs> if it takes one second to call an MD6 app, why is it taking all times as long? <coughs> it's like a failure of the wrapper. Oh, I understand why okay. it's taking more than five seconds. <coughs> That's a good question. Then you're going to force you me. Like this. You forced me to think think about these things now. I was, I was trying to avoid thinking about it. Um, there is an explanation that I kind of half thought thought through. Um, Passing in at underscore with 100,001 items, your code in the first line is shifting something to the front. I think that converts it to a real array. You are then passing it to add, which means it's being shut back on the stack. So there's quite a lot of argument going yeah. on there. You, you'll, you'll find when you use MITProf on a function that does very little in the function itself, but that function is called an awful lot you will see a discrepancy that, that is just the overheads. You know, the overheads of the argument class, marshalling. So the time spent in the sum is the time, the time is measured from <coughs> the enter subroutine opcode, which is called after the arguments have been put on, on, on the stack. And the time ends what, during the return before the result, if, if any, has been taken off the stack. So the time, for a subroutine call is really the time in the subroutine. Whereas the statement times are, um, well, let me rephrase it. So if you have a subroutine that then calls another subroutine and basically does very, very little else, and that's called a lot, the difference between the two sub subroutine times, the time spent in the outer one and the time spent in the inner one, is just the overheads. And you're seeing the overheads that you normally wouldn't see because they're, they're, they're tiny, but when you call it 200,000 times, the tiny overheads add, add up. And the, the add function itself is very fast. You know, it's five microseconds a call. Yeah. So it's five microseconds each call there. So that's why the discrepancy is so visible. If this was a much slower function, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't see such a difference. Does that make sense? So what you're really telling me, I should pick a better example, because if this one is uh, it's confusing me because the numbers don't add up, that's why I was scratching my head. Back. So speaking of numbers not add, add, adding up, there we go. That 2.49 there is the time spent executing that statement. But the only thing on that statement is this call, and it took 
one second in the call. So what's the difference there? And it's the same thing. It's the marshalling, and it's the method lookup too, because there's a method lookup going on to resolve what's going to get called. So this is kind of a, a mini lesson in interpreting an MIT block output. Uh, so th things get funky when you, you have very hot code that is very fast. Then you start seeing overheads that you normally wouldn't So in this case, interpretation, the overhead is 150%. When you're calling something that only takes five microseconds and you're calling it 200,000 times, then yeah. But, but, so take that, take whatever the difference is and divide it by 200,000 and you'll find it's, it's only a few microseconds. But that's the, the few microseconds that it takes to throw the value on, onto the stack and look up the method. A few microseconds, but it becomes visible when you verify it this way. It could be dollar underscore underscore shared. Sorry? Dollar underscore shared variable. Yeah. Like sort of global stash, I suppose. It is, yeah. Yeah. If it's how the official one. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, what's sort of a life cycle of that? Um, it's just a global, but it's kind of the official one. The is it cleared one. at the end of the session? What is Sorry? it? Is it cleared at the end of the session? At the end of the session, your entire backend process goes. Learn so um, this is unlike uh, MySQL, where it's threaded and okay. things can persist. In Postgres, it's more like a, Apache okay. in that there's a master process, and when you connect, it forks off a child, and that child handles your your database session, and then <coughs> at the end of the session, the, the the process dies. Can you pop something onto it in the Postmaster and have it available in the children? You could if you preload Perl in the, yep. the Postmaster. Okay. But you have this problem with PL Perl versus PL Perl U. Yep. You might initialize something in the Postmaster, but you could put something in into it uh, in the init, okay. and then it, you know, it might happen in the postmaster, or it might happen during initialization inside the child. But it will always happen. It will always happen. This wasn't a question. This is more a statement of good news. Um, yeah, hot stuff and being slow. It's not going to work. I don't think for method over call, method calling, but uh, for subroutine calling, I prototype something, and I believe Zephyr has written a much better one that actually lets you. Uh, produce subroutines which are also capable of being inline as ops, which means you can get rid of the subroutine call overhead. You would have to write things initially, but, uh, maybe I think you have as well. I don't know the full details on this, but it will be a 514. This is the custom op? Custom, not custom ops have existed for ages. It's yeah, the ability it's... to tag a subroutine with a, oh, here is also an opcode variant of me, right. so that the <coughs> interpreter will automatically, the newest interpreter will automatically inline it as ops. Whereas any existing interpreter will go oh, and just call it normally. Yes. Which will, not in that case, because it's a method call, but if you didn't have a regular subroutine call, well, yeah, get rid of half your overhead. Yeah, be Something nice. like that. The downside is MIT Roth won't profile for you. At, <laughs> at the moment, we need to add some way to tell MIT Roth that this custom hot code is worth paying attention to and to treat it as a, a subroutine call. Which is it's doable, we just, it's just not there now. I don't know. The settings are somewhere else. Yeah, it's around. I'll, I'll point that out. I'll point that out. How much is the method called lookup? Well, you, you, you can kind of say out. that it's about one second in here and two and a half seconds on that line. So there's one and a half seconds spent putting stuff on, on the stack and looking at and getting the value of this and looking at the method. So how, you know, how much of that is the argument, how much of that is getting the value, and how much of that is the value of that? So that is something you can add and then call the code reference and see how much faster it is. It's going to be so yeah, slow. It's, that's all going to be, that's actually <laughs> can't You've got the code there. <laughs> that's going to be slow. Yeah. So how, because well, the can of does, you, what that's doing is effectively can and immediately using the result. Yeah. Maybe you can call it once. Yeah, the method lookup gets cached, so we need to check the cache first. But basically, you know, because you know one, one second is uh, five microseconds per call, then one and a half seconds, you're talking about maybe seven microseconds to do the overhead. And normally you wouldn't care about seven microseconds, but when you do it 200,000 times, it shows up. Okay. Uh, any more questions? I don't know if I have any, any more. Let's pick the right thing. Here we go.
Do I have any more slides? No, I don't. <laughs> and I have probably two minutes. Two minutes. There you go. So what should and shouldn't you do in the database and file? What should stay out and what should go in? Okay, basically you should do on the server things that uh, require large volumes of data to generate a small result. Okay. So you're not shipping a lot of data back to the client and then working on it back to the result. You're doing it in the server. And generally that's a good idea because one of the biggest overheads is actually the network latency. Yeah. Yeah. So generally it's a good idea to, to crunch the data on the server. The only time it's really not is if your server is o overloaded and then it makes sense to distribute the overhead out to the clients. So that's, that's, that's a rule of thumb. Also the other ben benefit is you can encapsulate business logic that you want to, to not put into the clients. So if you have clients in different languages, for example, you would have to duplicate business logic. So by putting it in the server as a stored procedure, you can encapsulate it and gain the benefits of encapsulating it. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.